Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! The election campaign was, of course, put on hold following the terrorist attack in Manchester on Monday night. But now that campaigning has resumed, it's hardly surprising that security is now a primary concern. The Labour Party has announced it would recruit a thousand more intelligence officers and thousands more police. Jeremy Corbyn, speaking on ITV's Peston programme a short while ago, says previous cuts have undermined security. It seems that the cuts in police numbers have led to some very dangerous situations emerging. It's also a question of a community response as well, so that where an imam, for example, alerts the police that he's very concerned about somebody, I would hope they would act. And I hope they would have the resources to act as well. Joining me now from Leeds is the Shadow Justice Secretary, Richard Bergen. Welcome to the Sunday morning, Politics, Joe. Richard. I'm fine, thank you. How are you? Very well, thanks. Now, this weekend you've announced a thousand more security and intelligence agency staff. That, of course, is in line with what the government's already announced. And the Shadow Home Secretary, Diane Abbott, has said today you won't be spending any more money. So it doesn't amount to very much, does it? Well, that's just uh, one of the parts of our uh, pledge card on uh, safer communities. There's also... Uh, 10,000 extra police, because remember, the Conservative government has cut the police by 20,000, and our 10,000 extra police would mean an extra police officer in each neighbourhood. There's also 3,000 extra prison officers in our pledge, because the prison staff has been cut uh, by 6,000. That's the third since 2010 by the government that's not helping keep communities safe. Also, we're pledging 3,000 extra firefighters. Also, the 1,000 extra security staff, as you mentioned, but also uh, 500 extra border guards as well, because uh, there have been uh, 13 instances or 13 areas identified um, where um, right. and our that's borders are as secure as they should absolutely. be. Absolutely, and that's the list of numbers that you've given me to cover all those broad areas. But if we concentrate on the security services, because it was Jeremy Corbyn who said there will be more police on the streets under a Labour government, and if the security services need more resources to keep track of those who wish to murder and maim, then they should get them. So why aren't you giving them more resources? Well, we're uh, committing to a thousand. Yes, but the uh, government, the government's staff. doing that too. If you were going to do something over and above that and actually commit more money, you're not doing so. Well, the government hasn't yet uh, uh, delivered uh, on uh, that promise. Uh, we will deliver on that uh, promise. But, what but with no made, more money, just what, to be clear. What Jeremy's made very clear is that you can't do security on the cheap. Austerity has to stop at the police station mm. uh, door. Austerity has to stop at the hospital door as well. But uh, we will be giving the resources required to keep our communities safe. So you'll give them the resources, Richard Bergen, um, the security services and the police, as you say, um, and more powers? Well, the police uh, need to be empowered, but when you listen to what the Police Federation are saying, they've been speaking out for a long time about the danger uh, caused uh, by police cuts. And I'm talking uh, not only about terrorism, not only about acts of extreme violence, but also anything from uh, anti-social behaviour sure. to burglary to Can violent crime. Can I just crime. pick up on what you said at the beginning? You said more powers. What sort of powers are you thinking of giving the security services? Well, we need to listen to the security services. Well, we that's need not to a power, is it? To, well, we need to listen to the security services, to the intelligence community mm. uh, and to the uh, armed forces uh, and to the police federation and to the police about how they think uh, they, uh, our communities can be made safe. But one thing's clear, cutting the number of police by 20,000 makes our communities less safe, not more safe. Four. Sure. Now, you said you're going to listen to the security services. Can voters be reassured and guaranteed that Jeremy Corbyn will listen to the security services and the police in terms of more powers, if that's what they want? Because well, up till now, Jeremy Corbyn has spent his whole political career voting against measures designed to tackle homegrown and international terrorism. Well, I think Jeremy Corbyn's speech uh, on uh, safer communities mm. uh, earlier this uh, week made clear he is listening to the security services. So he would grant those new powers for... because he voted against the Terrorism Act in 2000, the Terrorism Act in 2006, in 2011 the introduction of terrorism prevention and investigation measures and in 2014 the data retention and investigatory powers act so which new powers will he be happy to enact 
just to say, uh, Jeremy Corbyn, along with Theresa May, David Davis, and many Conservative MPs, voted against legislation where they thought it would be ill-advised, ineffective, or actually counterproductive. It's a very complex mm. situation. What we don't want to do uh, is introduce hastily prepared laws with one eye to the newspaper headline, which can actually act as recruiting sergeants sure. for terrorism. And actually, when I said earlier that Jeremy Corbyn made clear in his speech earlier this week that he's been listening to the uh, security community, it's clear because what he said about the international situation has also been said by the ex-head uh, of uh, the MI5, uh, Stella Remington, and her predecessor as well, and as well as President uh, Barack Obama, sure. by the way. So can we look at the powers that you might want to introduce? You say you will give uh, the police and the security services the resources and the powers they need. If we look back at some of the legislation that Jeremy Corbyn and others voted against, in 2000, for example, it gave the Secretary of State the power to prescribe terrorist organisations and made it illegal to finance terrorist organisations. Does Jeremy Corbyn still think that would be a bad idea? He wouldn't vote in favour of those sorts of measures? Well, Jeremy Corbyn, as I say, along with Theresa May, David no, sure. Davis and I know others, you want to try and bracket it with no, Conservatives no, who've done the same, but I'm interested in what Jeremy Corbyn's going to do when let, he let says we're going to be smarter, we're going to be smarter about fighting terrorism. If he's not prepared to vote in favour of those sorts of measures or others which outlawed the glorification of terrorism or trying to impose restrictions on suspects, I'm just trying to find out, and people want to know, what is he going to do? It's, it's a complex uh, situation. With this legislation, as you'll know, the devil is often in the detail. If it were as simple that you could stop terrorism by voting a piece of legislation through Parliament, then terrorism would have been stopped a long, long time ago. Sadly, there are no easy answers, and that's not just recognised by Jeremy Corbyn. It's recognised by uh, Barack Obama, by Stella Remington, who is the head of the MI5, by David Davis and by other Conservative MPs. What is clear, as Jeremy made clear in his speech earlier, this week is the way things are being uh, done currently isn't working but we've got to be tough on terrorism tough on the unforgivable acts of murder that are carried out but also tough on the causes of terrorism as well but the sad truth is there are no easy answers if there were easy answers then the problem would have been solved a long time ago sure but I think voters might want to ask the question that if you want to employ more security and intelligence officers but your leader is still uncomfortable with giving them the powers that they need to do their job because as you say it's complicated legislation legislation. They'll want to know how you're going to do it. I mean, let me just give you this example, which is a recent one. At another Stop the War rally in 2014, Jeremy Corbyn said that the murder of UK aid worker Alan Henning by ISIS was the price of war, the price of intervention, the price of jingoism. So, according to Jeremy Corbyn, the beheading of a charity worker is to be blamed on UK foreign policy. Well, uh, at the beginning of that speech by Jeremy Corbyn, he mentioned the importance of the one-minute silence for the uh, memory of Alan Henning, who was so uh, cruelly and un unforgivably murdered. What Jeremy Corbyn's also made clear is that responsibility for acts of terrorism and murder lies uh, with the murderer. And something that's really disappointed me is that the Prime Minister, Theresa May, at an international conference the other day, said that in Jeremy Corbyn's speech on this issue on Monday, he said that Britain was to blame for the uh, heinous, unforgivable act of murder on Monday night. She knows he didn't say that. She's a very intelligent person. Whether she agrees with him or not on his politics, she knows he didn't say that in his speech, which was widely accepted even by his opponents. But what troubles me is we've got a Prime Minister who must have sat down with her advisers early that day and said, well, I know he didn't say that, but if we say he did, then guess what, we might win some votes. I think that's shameful. I think that shows that Theresa May can't be trusted. These issues should transcend party politics. We do need to pull together on this issue. Richard Bergen, thank you very much. Well, the Conservatives have promised a new statutory commission to counter extremism. The party says it will identify extremism, including the non-violent kind, and help communities stand up to it. Also this morning, the Security Minister, Ben Wallace, has attacked internet giants for failing to tackle terror online and accused them of being ruthless money-makers. And Mr Wallace joins me now. Welcome to the Sunday Politics. Those comments that uh, you have made about social media companies failing in their responsibility to take down extremist material, what are you going to do to compel them? Well, I think we are going to look at the range of options. We've seen the Germans have proposed perhaps a fine. Uh, I, we're not sure whether that's going to work, but I think there are a range of pressures we can go 
uh, to, we can put on to some of these companies. Some of them have complied. In, in, in the article on the Sunday Telegraph today, I did say that it's not all of them. But I think there are, you know, they are not immune to pressure. We either can do it internationally, and the Prime Minister urged at the G7 an international response, sure. because some of these companies are based overseas. But I think there are a range of issues. There's law, obviously we could change well, the law. Well, let's There's have a look at that. Pressures. I mean, you mentioned the G7, and rhetoric and warm words are fine to a certain extent, but it's action that people want mm -hmm. to know. If you've made these very impassioned uh, remarks in the newspapers about them failing to do their job or take their responsibilities, people want to know what powers do you actually have now to say to social media companies, take down this material? Well, we do have the Investigatory Powers Act that was uh, recently passed. I mean, and have just, you used it? Yes, we have used it, but in this area, we've just finished consulting on one of the measures that we could use, uh, but we can't, obviously, we're in Perdus, we can't, uh, obviously, preempt the consultation. Um, we have, right now, officials from my department are over, as we speak, in the uh, United States with American officials working with the CSPs, um, because what we do see is they do respond to pressure. Um, the, the best example, if I may, Joe, is, is give the example about we think they have the technology and the capability to change the algorithms they use mm. that maximises profit over something safety. Right, but you are relying on these companies devoting more resources to this particular line of work that you would like to see them do. Have you got any evidence that they're going to do that? Well, they have said we had a, only a, a few weeks ago, before the election was called, we hosted the Home Secretary, hosted a round table with them. <coughs> we have evidence that they are trying to improve it. There are a few who are refusing to or being difficult. I'm not going to name them. And that's why I think the Prime Minister was right to step up not only the language he is using, but to say we are going to not allow this to progress anymore. Right. People will be worried about who's going to make the judgment about what is unacceptable and what should be taken down. Let me just show you and the viewers this particular... Uh, this was actually shared widely uh, across social media. Um, and if you read that quote, I suppose you could argue it's at the tame end, if you like. Um, the man in the picture is a terrorist uh, hate preacher, a jihadist, and he was killed in Yemen by the Americans. But would this be the sort of thing you would be demanding social media companies take down? Well, I think you have to look at the context that it is deployed in. Mm. Uh, well, I, it, was it was shared well, widely no, no, across... I mean, I, I could show you uh, some of the 270,000 pieces we have had removed uh, in, since 2010 uh, from internet sites that are extreme. The it, big issue here is not often the individual image. It is the way these companies set up their algorithms to link you. So you look at that, and if you were watching that on Facebook, for example, delivered to you will be, perhaps you'd like to look at this, because that is how they set it up. If you go onto YouTube, but let's say, you know, I'm from the Northwest, let's say I put in Manchester, suddenly you can get led down a path to watching more of more because I, they are designed I to maximise understand, I understand the logic mm. of your argument. What I'm asking is, at a practical level, mm. are you expecting social media companies to take down that sort of post if it appeared? Yes, I, th I think... You are. We are expecting, I mean, not specifically... I mean, No, but, but, but you can but see yes, whether... Anything, who's going to well, make, who's going well, to make uh, the decisions uh, uh, about what well, is going to radicalise young people that could lead someone down the well, path if, to then let off a bomb? If, if, if I invite your viewers to look at the work The Guardian had done on the Facebook guidance, which said, for example, that it is OK to produce uh, videos or, or, or broadcast videos of seven-year-olds being bullied as long as it wasn't accompanied by captions. I don't think you need to be a government minister or an expert to say that is unacceptable. Or something more worrying for you as a journalist and, and me as a politician, another set of guidance that says, and this is, I think, quite menacing, and this is the mindset that I think we have to deal with, that says certain people don't deserve, deserve our protection, is the exact quote, and that includes journalists All right. and politicians uh, and people that are controversial. So no. I think there is more work to be done but at the end of the day, it's the pathway that this stuff leads to. You sure. watch it, that. It's more about examining what powers you actually have and how much progress you're going to be able to make. I mean, the government says there are up to 23,000 potential terrorist attackers in this country. 3,000 of those considered to pose a serious threat and are under investigation or being monitored in 500 separate operations. 20,000 others are considered as residual risk. That's pretty disturbing. These are big numbers. They are big numbers, and I think... You know, what, what the tragedy of Manchester shows us is that it's not a, this is not about failure. This is about the scale of the challenge we face. And it's why it is absolutely important that alongside people is powers. Right. Should uh, you double the size of MI5, well, for example, which has been called... We for? have increased 
year on year in real terms, not only the money but also the numbers uh, of people in MI5s. We've now, it's actually 2,000 uh, that we have committed to increase uh, to before the attack, not just uh, Jeremy Corbyn's response to the attack, before our manifesto we have recruited, we've increased the whole of government spending on counterterrorism from uh, £11.7 billion in 2010 up sure. to, uh, in 2015, you, up to £15.7 billion. Like double, like double the size of MI5 well, and no. expand the number of intelligence well, uh, police in, in my that. discussions with the Director General of MI5 and his deputies and all the other people I meet, I ask them on a regular basis if they have the resource that uh, they are happy with. And right. their answer comes back time and time again, yes, All we right, well, are. Well, let's have a look at the powers then, um, because you have quite extensive powers at your disposal. The question is, are you using them? Um, I mean, ter terrorism prevention and investigation measures were introduced in 2012 to replace control orders, which were considered to be more stringent, but they've rarely been used. Only seven are currently in operation. Why? When you look at the numbers that I've just read out before, about 23,000 potential terrorist attackers in this country. Well, because there are a whole, it's just one tool in the toolbox. So, right. for example, other powers we use, we take away people's passports if we think they're about to travel, mm. How uh, many to go and train. That uh, I can't comment on that number. That is a, a sensitive issue. Uh, we but have... I've got the numbers for who's plen under TPIN. Pl plenty of people are currently... Uh, uh, finding that their passport has been removed. And at the same time, we strip people of citizenship, if they have another citizenship elsewhere, to make sure they don't come back to their country. And on top of that, because of the investment we've made in GCHQ and MI5 and police counterterrorism, we have more powers and more ability to monitor them. But are you using them enough in your mind? Well, I mean, if we're talking, I mean, I've used the example of TPIMS, um, and only seven are currently operation. That sounds like a very small number. You won't give me uh, the numbers of some of the other measures that are at your disposal in terms of citizenship and removing passports. But if they are only in single figures, that doesn't seem to compare with the numbers who are being monitored. Well, no. It, also, we have to strike a balance between... Uh, we have to do two things. We have to satisfy the court. So we have to make sure that there is enough evidence to restrict people's freedoms. TPIMs do all sorts of good things for keeping us safe. It sends people up to 200 miles away from where they live. It tags them, it monitors them, prevents them using computers Are they as the good internet. as control orders? The they are. Lord and I tell Carlyle you why they are... Independent Review of Terror Law says they're not. I tell you why they are better, and Lord Kalal does know this. The control orders were on track to be struck down by the courts because, as I said, one of the things we have to satisfy is the courts. But the other thing is we have to satisfy, we have to make sure we get the balance between the communities right and the measures we take. If we alienate our communities, we won't get the intelligence that allows us to catch it. And can I just say one uh, thing, Joe? Very, it's very you know, briefly. There is no point having more police and intelligence services if you don't give them the powers to do the job. Jeremy Corbyn consistently voted sure, down again. Sure, and I've done that with yeah, Richard Burke. You know, he will license James Bond to do precisely nothing, well, and he will deploy police with their armour behind their back. He, that's not going to help security. Ben Wallace, thank you.